So, so no, I don't. Do, so what I'm saying isn't really the text. It's about the ideas. So therefore, the text doesn't need to coexist. The only thing that's important is, is copy and paste, so that one doesn't need to retype it. Um, but you. Th but then your words. Well, let's let's have this conversation on. Okay. Let's record this because I, I think wonder, we're ready I mean, to I talk. If yeah. At this stage, the smart thing to do is to kind of do both or be thinking about both. And one, the, the, the what's needed to what one needs to do is rather overlapping in both cases, so one might as well. Um. So when you when you built the incision macro. Excision. Excision incision. Yes. Um. And it's actually a toolbar button. Uh, yeah, the, the tool, yes, but that, yes, that's probably why I'm not quite getting it. Um, but I would imagine that it's changeable, because right now what happens is I highlight text, and if I excise it, that text goes somewhere else. I want this text to stay where it is, so that I've not yeah. messed with the original, and to leave my mark, and that's kind of... I think that's. A, I think it's a. It's a. It's a different toolbar button. Okay. And and it's and but but it's um it's similar to what many of the other toolbar buttons do, which is to wrap the selected text with a prefix and a suffix. Um, that's a very common operation, and it's what you need here. Okay. Um, so it would take the selected text, it would wrap it in your agree or disagree. Um, so I guess we're talking two tools. Two. Well, tools. yeah. Agree tool and a disagree tool that would uh, um, prepend a different macro name. Um, but yeah, I think it's a different operation. Excise is, is quite specifically concerned with well, with this chopping up idea, with, um, um, you know, where you, you it's, uh, the, the desired outcome is to have more tiddlers. Well, that's what I like about it because it also, and I also want to create the tiddlers out of my agrees and disagrees at the same time. So that, that, then I, I, I think that what might be um, happening here is, is, is this very traditional tension between uh, um, uh, instincts of textuality where you want a text notation that makes intuitive sense um, versus the actual physics of things like which actually would take you to a different solution, which is the thing I said before, where we would chop the text down into individual tiddlers up front, right down to individual sentences, um, and uh, then we would attach our comments to individual sentences. So this idea of inlining the um, agreement, disagreement, it kind of in a textual tradition, that would be right because it's literally marginalia. It's inserting, um, inserting stuff um, at the point of relevance, um, but uh, so not literally marginalia, as it turns out. Um, but I think that you know, if Tiddly Wiki teaches us anything, it's to abandon um, the last vestiges of those principles um, of trying to make the text itself um, convey information. Instead, Tiddlywiki is saying um, use tiddlers and tiddler relationships to convey it. So, without needing to do development, what could we do if instead of going to the sentence level, we went to the paragraph level, and then you basically end up in effect tagging paragraphs with the presence of keywords, which you could do fairly easily by having the keywords identified and then text searching them, right? Um, and paragraphs seems feasible because we could yes. set my man exist to do that automatically or manually, either way. Automatically, so the text based tool um, could do this. Which text? Okay. Um, uh, we could try it out. Um. So, so we'll, we'll, but we can use the excise tool, which is a tool that's easily available to everybody, just to demonstrate how we break the paragraphs off, and then maybe the first one will go and tag those paragraphs with our keywords kind of thing. 
and we'll Absolutely, so, yeah. and then from there we'll just and we'll end up with Vandendorp one today and we'll say that that's what we're going to do moving forward yeah okay I, mean, I, I, th I think it's I think it's probably um, fruitless to do uh, I mean what we should be doing at the moment is discussing the multiplicity of ways that we could hypertextualize the text we don't really need to decide which one because um, that may become clearer as we start trying to do it but getting it getting a lot of understanding the tension between the different options that actually does seem quite interesting okay anyway we're almost ready to pardon the i'm sorry i'll leave it to you to uh yeah lead into and we're almost ready he's got a big monitor running is it gonna work 704-992-6330 i don't know what they're doing but now we've got this running that's michelle by the way hey gary <laughs> So you can see that, I think. I don't know. Yeah, now I can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not, not sure. Not working anymore. Am I hearing that? Yeah. Can you make sure? Oh, now he's having connection so, troubles. What we have to do, Stevie, yeah. is because you want us to view your screen and his screen at the same time, right? So what we need is another laptop now next to you with just the Zoom session on because we got to see your screen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we need yes. another computer. But then he'd not be able to see mine. No. Right. That doesn't work. Let's record the Zoom session now because we're down to like a 20 minute record. And so just start with, um, and we'll just do it the traditional way. So are you recording, Steve? Am I recording? Yeah. No. Because I don't have access to the Zoom because I don't have no sound on this one. So you want me to record it? Yeah. Okay. Record on this computer. And I'm going to stop my share and say, good morning, Jeremy. How are you doing today? Good morning, Steve. I'm very well, thank you. So I am, I am you, you know me, but for those who are watching the podcast, I'm Steve Schneider. And I um, have convened the Design Rights Studio. And I teach the two classes that are participating in the studio um, at SUNY Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York, and you are not here. Uh, no, indeed. Um, I'm Jeremy Rustin, a uh, open source software developer um, based in Oxford in the United Kingdom, where it's late afternoon, just about to get dark. Yes, and we've, um, we've met through TiddlyWiki, which of course is the platform that we use here, um, and you are, I, I call you Mr. TiddlyWiki, I don't know if that's fair or not, but you, you're the sole inventor of it, I think? Yeah, yeah, certainly the originator. But yeah. I wouldn't be doing it, um, I wouldn't have been doing it, it wouldn't have lasted more than three months if it wasn't for the way that it instantly turned into an open source project right. with other people. And, and that's what, yeah, and that's what's really interesting is a, a couple of different things. It's open source, so whatever work you do is available to others, um, some of it, you know, the development work. And then there's a cult community of people who keep adding to it, and I think that's wonderful. So, um, and over the next couple of weeks, um, seven or eight, I think we've got on our schedule. What our plans are is to talk about a book, um, and to talk about how this book, um, written by Christian Vandendorp, called "From Papyrus to Hypertext," um, about how this book, which talks about hypertext, might help us understand how to use TiddlyWiki. That's one of my goals, and also help us understand from, and the reason I've asked you to join this conversation is, is how your understanding of, of hypertext is shaped by TiddlyWiki and how your understanding of TiddlyWiki might be shaped by hypertext. So I'm hoping that, and I'm fairly confident that we'll have some, some interesting and um, robust discussions. Um, and so today what we want to do, and I'm going to share my desktop now. Um, and we're just going to chat about different ways that we can, I don't know, is it hypertextualize? Or I've been calling it weakify lately. Um, how we can weakify this book by Vandendorp. And, um, and we, we want to talk a little bit about different techniques and in the conversation talk about what it means to hypertextualize a text. So, so why don't you jump in because we, we've been chatting a little bit about what you think um, that might look like, and, and so what do you think about this this book, and, and what are some ideas you have about the values that we could add to those who are reading the book along with us? 
For me, this is about. I've got an echo there. Um, it's about active reading. So, um, Steve uh, produced this book a few weeks before I went on holiday, and I had the really fun experience of reading it on holiday in this quite active way, where I was uh, making uh, notes in the margins and underlining the passages that uh, I found particularly. Um, interesting. And now I think we're on to uh, the next stage of the active reading process, which is to make something based on our understanding of the text. And to uh, the hypothesis is that the making of the thing will also reinforce and extend our understanding of the text. So the next stage, if you like, of um, there's a stage of reading text where you just read it, there's a stage where you make these kinds of notes, and I think we're exploring a, a deeper engagement with the text, and for me that would be characterized by making something, mm -hmm. making something that we can share with other people, um, and that for, um, is a kind of a, a, a contribution, you know, um, not just something that happens within our own heads, that's already Right, and so that the notion of um, of active reading um, is something that we talk about. And I, I'm switching around my uh, Zoom session here. I don't know if it's going to matter in the final recording, but we'll it, we'll see. Um, so the idea of active reading, and then I, I think of it as writing. So we're writing on the text, maybe, or at least about the text, writing a set of commentaries or or pointers into the text for others. So we're trying to enhance their understanding. And, and, I, I, and I would agree that, that the, the students in the class or participants in the workshop who might be reading along with us over the next couple of weeks, couple two months, I think, um, they might find this helpful. Um, they, might choose to read their, they might choose to read the text first and then our comments or our comments and then the text. And that's up to them, of course. Um, I was curious to know what you thought about the structure of this book. It's written in a series of essays, not chapters, but essays, 40 of them, which is a lot. And I must admit, that's what drew me to it initially, because um, the chunks are smaller than these 70 page or 30 or 40 page chapters. I like the three, four, five page essays. Um, well, I, yeah, that, that it, it chimes very uh, much with me. One of my motivations with Tiddly Wiki um, was to explore the belief that I have long held, which is that if you give people a canvas of a particular size, that they will fill that canvas, and that the Microsoft Word version of that in corporate life and probably in academic life is 20-page Word documents with lots of standard stuff top and bottom. Worse than that, though, that, that to me, I really don't read much non-fiction these days, apart from kind of um, you know, stuff on the internet. Um, and the, non-fiction like this and part of the reason is that I find it generally to be really overwritten um, and I guess the more populous the book is the more likely that is to be the case where in other words it's designed to be consumed like a Bill Bryson book something that you just sort of wallow in for a chapter it's a bit repetitive there's a lot of anecdotes it's very easy and I really hate that kind of thing because it requires the wrong kind of investment and this um, embodies the principle that I've adopted to try and avoid that danger, and that principle is to cut things up into the smallest possible units. So I think by nominating these 40 chunks, by giving himself the discipline of a particular number of chunks, that he actually ended up writing a short book um, that he would have done if he'd sat down in the standard way and just sort of oratorially um, uh, rabbited on about the topic. Well, inter um, interestingly enough, though, he says, and this is in the first chapter or the first essay, um, and I'm going to scroll. I think I'm still sharing my. Um, you are, yeah. Yeah. So he he he, he talks about that um, when he conceived of the book, most of the research was written using a mysterious, we don't know what, hypertextual tool developed for that purpose, and so, but then when he gave up the book. He went through this process that he says of putting it in a book, and then he talks a little bit about the differences. And he, for him, that putting it in the book, and then he asks us in the preface to read it in order. A and it was just, you know, for me, coming to that was 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 surprising. 
and so I think I, I, I love that and the, and the, um, app, sorry I interrupted you yeah no no go ahead go 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 well, I was going to say that it fits it absolutely fits with my thinking that hypertext is a very good mirror for the way that our brains work but it's not a particularly good mirror for the way that our mouths work for the way that speech works it's still a book is based on the oral linear tradition um, and so it seems absolutely seems an essential characteristic and requirement of hypertext to me that one should be able to push out of it, so to speak, a degenerate version, which is the prior medium of the, the frequency text. Um, Thank so you. That, I mean, and the, and we sh we should end there because I <laughs> no, not that we really should, but because I think that that's absolutely critical, and that's something that I I, I need to pay more attention to that we can use tiddlywinky to produce, I'm not sure I want to call it a degenerate version of a text, but we can use tiddlywinky to produce a sequential text that's meant to be written read linearly and then maybe they, a, a reader comes back and rereads it for a different purpose and at that point you're ready to break it up into smaller chunks or at least we can serve all kinds of readers. It fits. Um. It's a pattern I really like, which is the idea of you have a skeleton, you build something around the skeleton, and then you take the skeleton away. And the result looks like magic. Because, you know, typically we're talking about things that you couldn't build without the skeleton being there. Uh, and so I guess uh, I wonder whether you make it actually it works better rhetorically. And I'm using that word, it must literally be true that it works better rhetorically as a linear text, because all of our rules of rhetoric are based on um, orality and yeah. linearity. So then, to me, it's not surprising that um, I, I have another adage, if you want to tell a story, the most compelling way to tell a story is with a movie um, in this day and age. Maybe we are soon, but at the moment it's a movie. Um, and again, a movie feels like the same kind of degenerate version of if I handed you a memory stick of every, you know, every piece yeah. of footage shot shot during an event, which would give you multiple perspectives on that event in a movie in the traditional sort of edited, spliced together sense is again, a simplified version of it. Um, well, so actually, no, yeah. that, that's uh, um, yet more characteristics that I very much like about the book. I found it a pleasure to read. Um, I so don't read much non-fiction, but I really enjoy um, something that I enjoyed out of last year's book, which is the positioning of stuff I'm very familiar with in a historical tradition um, or in history, and here the history goes back to, to sort of the, the dawn of writing three and a half thousand no more, six thousand years ago um, and uh, that's really cool, it's a really uh, mind expanding and interesting perspective to have on what I do and I may say it's completely upended my um, working definition for hypertext Good, because it has mine too. So, so, so let's spend a few minutes chatting about. I know you have some ideas too. Uh, um, so, what should we do? Because what should we do? it's tiddly weakers, <laughs> tiddly weaky writers. I feel, especially since we're teaching or I'm teaching this class, so I want to use tiddly weaky to explore and understand this text. So, how should we do that? So I, I, I was advocating before we came on air that we should explore a multiplicity of approaches okay. and um, then go with what works. But I guess a simplified version of that would be for you, for me to do what I've been advocating and you to do what you've been advocating and or hypothesizing and then um, others to explore that. Um, and what I had suggested was building a traditional wiki of the subject matter um, is uh, how I summarize it, but it's just taking the um, key words and in some cases phrases used in the text and stringing them together in a network so that words like orality and tabularity can A, we can uh, tease out a very concise 10 word definition of those things, but crucially that we can use tagging and so on, linking to uh, um, uh, depict the relationships between the concepts and then ultimately I'd like to be able to produce diagrams which spatially lay out um, the keywords in the text and indeed explore different diagrams that are different maps of the text. 
how would you do that? Like, in Tiddlywiki, uh, you would... I would use something called Tiddly Map. Mm -hmm. So you could go to tiddlymap.org to um, see um, the kind of thing I mean. So this is um, an adaptation of an existing um, JavaScript uh, uh, library that does these blinds boxes diagrams into Tiddlywiki. So it'd be quite easy for us to read it. And it's designed to uh, very flexibly show tag relationships are the kinds of relationships. Okay. It's well, it's very good of you to speak while the page is loading. <laughs> yes, no, exactly. I must be loading from the other side of the world. Uh, or something, um, yes. But, but where, where Steve's, Steve asked me the question about my proposal. So here you can see the map at the bottom right. And um, you can navigate that map in um, normal kinds of ways. You can double click on things, I think, scroll around. And when you click on something, the associated Tiddler opens. So it's like a two-pane two interface where you've got your river of Tiddlers and alongside it a map, and you can use them together. So there's a button on a Tiddler to stay show me on the map as well, I believe. Okay, cool. Um, so I think the key difference uh, with Steve's um, been exploring um, ways of annotating text that are based on the fact that we have a textual copy of it. So we have a, um, a, 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 a what's the word, um, an EPUB, so to speak. So I should um, reveal sort of how I made that, just because um, this book, as far as I can tell, is not published electronically. So I ordered the book on Amazon used for $4. It arrived, actually it looked like somebody had gone to a library, taken it off the shelf and mailed it to me didn't say discarded or anything, so I'm worried about that a little bit. But then I took it to our print shop. We still have a print shop on campus um, where they cut the book with the paper cutter, where they cut the binding off, and then scanned the pages so I have a PDF of the book. Um, and and I, it violates the copyright of the author. And so I'm okay with having the text, um, and I think this is the, oh, that's the, not quite the original, that's the, um, that's my it's only a copyright violation if you redistribute it, having, having exactly. the of it for your own use, I think. Precisely. Fine. So I'm okay with ha and this is I, I've been playing with this for a while. I'm looking for the, the original one, the introduction X size. I want the introduction original. There it is. Um, no, that's not it so either. I think, I think what you're exploring here while you're finding the right, yeah. the right fiddler. But um, I'll just show you the code because this is your code. And so here I'm, this is where I made a keyword around the text. Um, and so it is, it's making inline modifications to the text um, to annotate it, which is um, intuitively, um, and I might say textually, an easy way to do it. It's quite close to um, uh, writing notes in the margin. Um, I've been arguing that it might, um, the job might be easier to instead cut the text up into smaller chunks and to make the annotations um, include references to those chunks. So it's the classic tiddlywiki um, uh, way of working, cut things up into the smallest possible chunks, and add to structure such as tags to enable you to weave them back together into the original so structure, the, the, also the, refer to them elsewhere. So at a tiddlywiki level, I'm gonna, I finally found the original text, so I'm gonna, I'll clone the tiddler. Um, And we'll give it another name. I'll save it just to make sure it's still there. And so I believe that, so let's say that we decided to use the paragraph, I think, as the model instead of the sentence. Um, so I'd highlight the first, and we can do this by code or I can do this by hand. I highlight the first paragraph. I hit Control E and I'm going to call it paragraph one. Um, and I'll tag it and I'll transclude it. Um, so so now I have a tiddler called paragraph one, and your suggestion would be that we might use tags and other kinds of pointers or create fields about that and leave that text intact? Uh, no, I'd, I'd, I 
I would cut the tech stuff into individual tidbits. So, it, but it is exactly um, the suggestion is exactly as you've done it. You'd, you'd go, go to sent. You want to go to sentences. Down to the level of a sentence. So you'd still you'd have a tidbit representing a paragraph, but that um, paragraph would in fact have a list field um, that contained the titles of the sentences or phrases um, within that paragraph, and then. Um, the code, if we did it by code, would be able to make a kind of heuristic decision based on things like line breaks and full stops and so on. Mm -hmm. But for students um, who are working with it now and who actually want to build something, because one of the possibilities is to take a text like this and build an assignment, and that's what we're going to do too. Um, do you think the paragraph works, or do you see well, you you really think that we should go to the sentence? I I think that we. Um, I, I think that what we do should be guided by what we do, um, and uh, everything here is is kind of what we think. And it might be that okay. it's better to feel our way um, in a bit of a ragged way, because I mean, we, what we're feeling towards here are rules, rules about conventions, about how big should the excisions be, how should we link them together. So some of it is boring technical detail and one of the great things about considering two different ways of annotating the text is it allows us when we go back to thinking about that we we can also consider the enormous difference in terms of the impact on our thinking of having something that stitched together from the original text versus something that's independent and so um, we shouldn't get too hung up in you know the what, what um, the, the, what, the, what matters, I think, is to um, uh, illuminate things at that level, to illuminate what are the steps we can take that will increase our understanding of the text, um, those kinds of questions. Um, and I'm a bit more, uh, you know, the, from a technical perspective, we already have, or I already have a plugin that can um, chop the text up by paragraph automatically and it does that pretty effectively and reliably and it would be fairly easy to do a little tweak to cut to sentences and it would be quite interesting as well so sure. you know, if, it, if it looks like a fruitful approach then okay. I think it would be worth doing and so really um, it's about um, figuring out whether it's a fruitful approach will be how valuable is it and that's partly what you'll learn by doing it in some other way um, is the value of you know, that extra investment to do that slicing up. So then what we... One of the things yeah. that... Go ahead. I, I, one of the things that I like about this approach is, for instance, the naming. So the fact that we've had to name this paragraph, that's a fabulous opportunity. The, the, the simplest type of, um, uh, of annotation is to scrawl a, a, a sort of descriptive name on each chunk to signpost the text. And uh, now um, there's the new feature that if we follow certain rules, we'll re-stitch things if we change the title. Yes, um, I've so noticed that. that. It's, um, yeah, so, so, so um, what we've just shared then is this conversation about how we are going to build a wiki. And that's the conversation that people have with me, with you, with others, with themselves when they start building a wiki. And so that, uh, that's why I wanted to go on with it a bit because it's never obvious and it's always different. It depends on what you, and you sort of feel your way through it, at least I do, and then you have something and that's the process. So um, I wanted to talk because we have like five minutes left and I wanted to talk about one thought each and you've got one of your own, and I'm gonna start with one, um, which was somewhere in the text, he talked about how in the final analysis, the immaturity of hypertext justifies the use of hard copy for this work. And I, he wrote this for the, it was translated in, in those, yeah, so it was, it was it, it, and so, I wonder, and I'm not looking for an answer, but I wonder if we're still there or if hypertext has matured to have supported a different kind of work. And that's, a, I, that's an open question, but I was just struck by that because he wrote, like you said, 99 was translated in 07. 
from French to English, but it's really, and he's in that era of the early scholars. Or not, uh, the, the turn of the century scholars when hypertext was, and the web was, was essentially still yeah. new, so. Yeah. I, I, th I think he was right, that, that there was nothing, um, you couldn't, then in 1999, you couldn't create the kind of writing environment, um, hypertext writing environment that we have now. And there's, there's lots of them, lots of yeah. great hypertext writing environments today. So, yeah, uh, when I read that, I just thought, gosh, how, um, how incredible to have written a book in 1999. And, you know, as ever, you'd have wonder whether the perspective um, would, would whether, you know, whether it's getting more, would get harder and harder to write the book with the perspective that he has had in 1999, because hypertext is increasingly, I would argue, getting folded into everyday life. And some of the, um, some of the sort of interesting conclusions that I've reached, um, or that I've learned reading the text now are actually almost so blazingly obvious in the yep. real world they wouldn't even get recognized as insights. And the paragraph that you wanted to draw attention to, I believe, is this one. Yeah. So, uh, yes. Um, and there are two. It's the first. It's the first introduction of the word tabularity. And that understanding what the book means by tabularity is recursively the key to understanding the book. Once you understand what the book means by tabularity, then I think everything falls into place. So it's not, it's the hardest word to define, and mm -hmm. it's possibly the word that the entire wiki would define if we were writing, writing a wiki. But um, uh, in the very next sentence, if there is a unifying thread in this book, it is to be found in this concept and this opposite that of linearity by spa oh, and in fact I did mean this next one by spatializing information tabular text allows the eye to go where it wants and enables the reader to get directly to the point he or she is interested in and the words that I'd underlined was spatializing information and um, this taps into uh, or reflects an insight that I've learned about user interfaces which is that um, there is a, a class of user interfaces that I've always found interesting is ones that spatialize the time dimension, the temporal dimension. And so video editing software is an example of that. But it doesn't have to do that. And even when it has an opportunity to do that, to show us an animation of the development of a document, it decides not to. But it's, it seems to me that spatializing time is such a valuable thing to be able to do, and that the time dimension is so important most of the information that one deals with on a sort of everyday basis, um, that it seems to me to be well worth exploring in its own right. Now I see that under the interpretation of this book, hypertext, which is, you know, hypertext is just the stuff to do with text that we're inventing now, really, you know, as Nelson invented it as a, as a word to sound modern, to evoke the idea that we were changing things and moving on. But in fact, spatializing information is what's been going on since we broke away from the limitations of scrolls, which yeah. is actually, I think, maybe in one of the later sections. Um, so we, the, the breaking away from the linearity of text has been going on since before printing, as what I've learned from the book. Um, and um, all the time, what it is, is spatializing more and more information. And... Um, so well, on that definition, um, TiddlyWiki's job is to spatialize information, and that maps quite well onto its mechanisms, which are about visualizing information in space. Um, so there you go, a lot yeah. packed into my little... Yeah, so, then, um, so what we'll do next week is we'll tackle essays one through five, in sort of in our own way, and we'll compare our work both for structurally how we use TiddlyWiki to understand it and also we'll see how our understandings are both shaped by our own experiences and knowledge as well as perhaps by the, um, our technical approach. Now I'm going to close with one thing that I found rather funny. Um, is that when I looked at the index, I did not see that. <laughs> um, that I'm sorry, I did not see this. That the... Oh, I've lost it. The, the references to tabularity are not 
the most. It, it, it would just surprise me. Um, and now I, I've lost my whole point. There it is. I don't. Yeah, I, I, it's I not don't true. Think that's <laughs> true, and I don't think it's ever been true. We're, we're conditioned to think of it because of Google PageRank. Layman's yeah. explanation being inbound links um, equals importance, but it's clearly not mathematically as simple as that. There's more things going on. Well, I guess my point was just sort of a humorous one: is that in fact the entry to tabulary does not have the most references to it. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing. I think that's, even though it's um, the might be the most important, but we'll see. So I will absolutely. see you. I will see you next week. So, so I guess the. Flipping that around, can we find something we can measure that does map on to this important concept? No, that's interesting. If not links, what is it? Yeah. Um, Steve, thank you. It's a great pleasure. I should look forward to next week. Okay. And, uh, Take care. Yeah. We'll see you. Bye now. Bye.